right, you want to lose uh, 30 pounds in 90 days. Yeah, I bet. Who doesn't? You uh, want to do it, and you want it to be extremely easy. Of course. I can do this. I can make this happen. I can even show you, but uh, the reality is you know you, and I have a feeling I know you too. But anyway, welcome to Walk Talk Vent. Let's do this. Well, guys, it's time to check in with Chronically Stephanie. Now we've fast forwarded to week seven and Houston, we have a problem. Hello, it's Stephanie. I am here for my week seven check-in. Um, I had gastric bypass surgery on September 9th, 2013. And my highest weight was 250 pounds, and my current weight is 201.1. I am so close to breaking that 200 mark, I can taste it. Um, unfortunately, I think it's going to be a little bit while, a little while longer before I break that mark. Um, I usually tend to lose about a pound to two pounds a week. Um, that seems to be my pattern, so I'm almost there. Um, that's good. Um, some stuff that's going on right now is uh, I want to talk about food getting stuck. I have gotten food stuck so much um, just in the past uh, two days. Three days um, I was sick all day on Friday after eating some chicken that got stuck and um, it was horrible. Like, I've had food stuck before, and it's just that, that pain, you know, right in your chest. Um, it feels tight. It feels like there's something stuck. Um, and usually that passes after a little while. Uh, Friday was the first time I actually got sick, and it was horrible. I got sick, and I got sick, and I got sick. And, um, you know, ever since then, everything I eat, even water, feels like it's getting stuck. So... What I think I'm going to do is call the doctor and uh, let them know. Um, I've heard uh, that those can be symptoms of a stricture. So I want to get that checked out because if, if it's painful for me to drink my water, I'm not going to feel like drinking it. And... That's a red flag, Stephanie. You haven't had this issue in the past, and all of a sudden you're feeling like the food is stuck. And... Boys and girls, we learned a new word today, stricture. So what's interesting is now Stephanie is starting to lose weight. She's close to 200, right? Makes you kind of wonder why the doctors had her go through a surgery when it looks like just with a little hardcore discipline, she was able to go from 250 to 200. Because keep in mind, what happens when you go through the surgery? It changes the size of your stomach from maybe a big fist or whatever like this to a tiny little egg size. So you're naturally gonna wanna eat less. One of the things I talk about when we're on our walks is we wanna shrink our stomach down. We don't really shrink our stomach down, we shrink our hunger down. And that's kind of what you go through with this process anyway. But anyway, as we move forward, we're gonna see if anything happens with this stricture that Stephanie's uh, going through. But either way, it's time for us to grab our shoes. Let's go for a walk. Hey, welcome to Walk Talk Vent. This is Jesse. If you're new here, we have three daily rules. We walk daily, we drink water at every meal, and we always avoid sugar. And while we aim to follow all three rules to a T, we must always adhere to at least the two-thirds rule. And this means that if any one rule is broken, we must strictly observe the other two. So imagine if you were trying to log into your bank 
And imagine as simultaneously as you're trying to log into your bank to check out your account and your balance and what have you, imagine a million other people were logging on right at that time and how much pressure that could put on the bank's system, so to speak. And it can just kind of create a situation where it's just overburdened, right? And so the, uh, the website for the bank would crash. Well, apparently this is what a lot of cyber hackers can do to our hospitals, to our electric companies and our electric grids and just companies in general. They can literally have it where they can crash networks. And from what I understand, and again, I could be wrong, if you know more about this, type it into the comments. I find it extremely interesting, but from what I understand, imagine, if you will, you have a situation where maybe there's a, an illness, we'll call it just, you know, the regular flu, you know, that hits every year. And imagine it's a, a challenging flu where people are kind of filling up the ERs. Now imagine the hospital's system as they're inputting new patients into the ER, imagine it being flooded. Imagine it being completely flooded and inundated with hackers. And apparently they can get this malware into your system and it might just kind of sit there idle, dormant if you will, undetected. And then all of a sudden, when the bad guys want to, they can flip a switch, so to speak, and all of a sudden the attack is on. And what's interesting is you might think, and I might think, that our phones and our computers, that we don't have any malware or any uh, viruses on there, right? But the reality is they might be on there undetected, dormant, just waiting just waiting for the operation to, to go green light, right? And, and that's, that's really something because like I was saying yesterday, could you just imagine what life would be like without your phone and without electricity for even one day? Now, try multiplying that out for a month. And again, it seems like 1994 was just yesterday to me if we go back to 1994 and we have this same scenario happen, right, where we could be without computers for a week or two, I don't think anybody would freak out at all because we literally had paper file backups back then. You know, you would have rooms dedicated with receipts and carbon copies, right, and bookkeeping. It was literally keeping the books back in the day and now everything is digital. Everything's typed up somewhere in, in a file, right? On a computer disk or, you know, on a computer hard drive. And just what does a bank do if all of a sudden, you know, in the course of snapping your fingers, they go from having billions of customers to all of a sudden their systems show that they have no customers. Or all of a sudden, instead of a couple million dollars uh, at the bank at any given time, maybe they have zilch. I don't know how much money banks keep on hand. I imagine it's a very small percentage and I'd imagine this wouldn't affect the cash on hand whatsoever, but everything's about accounting. So if the accounting is down, even if they have cash, they're not gonna hand it over to you, which makes you wonder, is it smart to maybe have 500 to $1,000 of cash on hand? I don't think it's smart to have much more than that because could you imagine if all of a sudden the government said, yeah, just to be safe, everybody try to have between two and $5,000 on hand. The thing that would happen the very next day is you would get a rash of home invasions. Everybody would be looking for that box of cereal where you keep your money hidden. And uh, by the way, if you ever, come into my house and start uh, opening boxes of cereal, you're going to be disappointed because all you're going to find is cereal half eaten. <laughs> so I just find that really, really interesting. Right now, and I'm sure many of you can echo this sentiment, right now I am getting on average about 10, not exaggerating, on average about 10 
phone calls a day from people that are trying to get my social security number. I don't know why they think I'm retired. I'd imagine it's because maybe I have a family plan with some folks that are retired. But ultimately, what's scary is you got to figure for every 100 or maybe 1,000 elderly folks, they're getting a handful of people that are actually giving them their social security number. And they're becoming successful at yanking money out of our retired friends and family members. And it's, uh, it's horrible. And I feel like, uh, I feel like our country always wants to throw money at a problem without fixing the problem. And this just seems like one of those things where I just feel like they're going to ask, they're going to ask the Congress and they're going to ask Senate, the Senate to pass more appropriation bills and create more funding. And all that does is make the prices go even higher. We are genuinely in a damned if you do, damned if you don't society right now. And I think it's one of those reasons why people do talk about things like the simulation. You know, this must be a simulation. It just looks a little too video game like, right? Where every darn decision has these radical waves that come from it. It's crazy. I remember when minimum wage was $4.25 an hour because that's what it was in the late 90s. And I remember back then, I really thought it was something cool that I think at the time I had a job that paid like 10 or 11 bucks an hour. Because I was like, hey, I'm working hard and I'm making three times minimum wage. But I knew when we started raising minimum wage from four to seven to 10 to 12, and I think here in Arizona now, I think it's somewhere around 12-ish or 15-ish And when I say minimum wage, I'm not talking about an official number. I'm talking about just the average, you know, the average person that has a minimum wage job in Arizona seems to make about 15 bucks an hour now. The problem with that is that when they were making 4.25 an hour, you could go buy a Whopper for 99 cents. Now that Whopper literally costs, you know, $12 $12 for the meal. I think the Whopper itself is like $6.99. But to be able to go and get a Whopper meal in the 90s for three or four bucks, and now that same meal costs $11 or $12, just seems like a real shame, just so everybody can keep saying that they made higher hourly than they did the year before. And you figure that you figure we would learn as a society, but apparently not. Apparently not. There is one thing that you can do that no matter how expensive or how inexpensive life is, there is one thing you can do to save money. And that's minimalism. One of my favorite YouTubers is a guy named Austin Williams. He takes minimalism to an extreme. Basically, minimalism is about decluttering your life, right? And also not wasting money on frivolous junk that you don't need. And Austin takes it to another level because even his shirts that he wears, instead of having different color shirts, which wouldn't hurt anything, he takes minimalism to a new level by literally having nothing but black t-shirts. Could you imagine if your wardrobe was nothing but blue jeans and black t-shirts, you know? But some people, to show that they really buy into minimalism and it's really changed their lives, some people will do those things, you know? So if you're really struggling with money and you don't really have money to invest, right? Because if you go to some gurus, they'll tell you, hey, your trouble is don't save money, invest it. Austin Williams is not like that. His thinking is, let's learn to live on less so that no matter how much money you have, at least you're making the most out of it by not spending it on frivolous things. Now, believe it or not, I consider myself to be a minimalism, but the difference is, I have a huge wardrobe. 
I have a bunch of shoes. I have a, a bunch of things that I like. But it's because I make goals. You know, hey, this month I'm going to buy a pair of shoes. Whereas other people might say, hey, this month I'm going to save this money in this account. And then when it gets to a certain amount, I'm going to put it into an index fund or roll it into my IRA or whatever the situation might be. And you can definitely do that. But considering most of us are living paycheck to paycheck and many of us are drowning in credit card debt, one of the best things you can do to get the best percentage on your money would actually be to pay off those credit card bills. Now, if you're contemplating bankruptcy and you've done the uh, analysis where you know the pros and the cons, it might be good for you to, to go ahead and file bankruptcy. One of the things I did when I was in my early 20s that really helped me a lot is I went to a consumer credit counseling and they were able to consolidate my bills into one lump sum. They contacted all the creditors and they were able to chop off the interest so that the money I was spending was going towards the balances. And I just remember what felt like an impossible mountain to climb. All of a sudden, like a year or two later, I was completely out of out of the credit card debt. And I believe if things haven't changed, they have it where you can even keep one credit card. I, uh, I am a firm believer in banking on yourself. If you're still a teenager and you still live with your folks and you have a job, save all the money you can. Because in the future, when you need to borrow money, it's really nice when you can just kind of borrow it from yourself. Because uh, you can charge yourself 0% interest The credit card companies are never going to do that. If you're my age in your 40s, you might have remembered, well, actually, I think this still occurs. You can do credit card transfer balances, right? Or balance transfers, excuse me. And I remember we used to do that with our phone bill back in the day, too. You would have MCI say, hey, if you switch to us, we'll take care of your old AT&T bill. (laughs) And so people would do that. They would rack up a $200 or $300 AT&T bill, switch over to MCI, get that bill wiped out, and then wait till their bill with MCI got big, and then flip back over to AT&T. I remember we used to do that all the time. Fast forward to the early 2000s, people would do that with their credit card balances, right? You'd have a $10,000 balance on your Visa, You'd have pretty much a bunch of available credit on your MasterCard. So before you know it, you would be reaching out to MasterCard and saying, hey, I want to do a balance transfer. And what they would do is they would let you take that $10,000 that you owed Visa. They would put it on the MasterCard credit card for you. But they would give you like a year of zero interest. So it was like we were always able to play games with money And we were always able to get out of debt pretty quickly as long as you were willing to tackle that debt as fast as you possibly could. Fast forward to modern day times, there really aren't ways to cheat the system anymore. Or if there are, please write them down in the comment section. The reason I say there's no way to cheat the system is because I don't look for ways to get one over on the system anymore. But I don't think you can just... uh, take your visa balance and put it on your MasterCard anymore because you're not getting any zero balance transfer offers. As a matter of fact, every now and then I'll get a what's in your wallet ad. Who is that? Capital One. And they send you these offers like it's the greatest thing in the world. And then you read the APY, the annual percentage rates and stuff and yields. And the card is literally 30% interest. I don't know about you, but I don't want to borrow a thousand dollars and then by the end of the year paying minimum payments, you basically have to pay back 1300 bucks. And that's if you pay it off at the end of the year, right? If that bad boy keeps going, it's compounding monthly. That, that's not a good deal. Not a good deal at all. 
So again, if you're stuck living with your folks in your early 20s, or maybe you've gone broke in your 30s or 40s and you find yourself moving back in with your old man or whatever the situation is, take advantage of that. Save your money, pay off every bill you can because we live in a world where everything is expensive and I don't see the prices going down anytime soon. I really don't. Even if there is a correction, you're never going to see $100, you know, shoes go back down to 40 bucks. You're just not going to see that. And these cars, what are they going to do if they go down in price? Are they going to go from 40,000 to 38,000? I mean, who cares? It's still super expensive. And to know that we used to be able to borrow money at one or two or three percent interest as consumers because the banks were able to borrow money at zero percent interest. Now, holy moly, I don't know what the interest rate is now, but it must be high. So we've got all these stresses and these stresses financially, they put us in a situation where we can't buy an extra 48 pack of water. We can't buy a hundred dollars worth of rice and beans to put in the pantry. And that's terrifying. That is downright terrifying. I watch every day how there's migrants in Chicago and New York City and there's a lot of people that feel like they're being leveraged out, right? If you look, it looks like the black community in Chicago feels like they're being leveraged out for the migrants. In New York City, they feel like they're being leveraged out for the migrants. You start to hear grumblings, you know. Oh, the migrants, they get a credit card with $10,000 available to them, yada, yada, yada. And that's the tough thing. We live in this world where we hear these stories about these things that our government does and all it does is add money to the debt and it seems to add money to the inflation problems. Oh, it's really disgusting. I heard the other day that somebody in 1983 that was making $30,000, which if you think about it, that's not that much money, even in 1983. But that adjusts to like 130,000 nowadays. And that is just disgusting. It really, really is. The amount of money that we have to pay for different items, you know, whether it be, you know, fancy uh, sports and athletic shoes for the kids, video game systems, the whole nine yards, every single thing is so expensive. Yet when you find out about how it's made, you find out that it's not even made here in America where people are making 20 bucks an hour and you can justify the price. It's made in, you know, these towns where they're basically using borderline slave labor. And that blows me away. You know, I used to do that same thing when I was younger. I would roll down my window as I drove through the neighborhood so everybody could hear the music that I was blaring. But as you get older and you become a little bit of an Archie Bunker, you start to ask yourself like, geez, does everybody need to listen to what you're listening to, mister? It looks like junior high is getting out. I would have never walked this way if I'd have known that. It's already 5.15, what are these kids getting out now? These must be the kids with in detention or something, or sports. Probably detention. It's totally cloudy today and I absolutely love when it's cloudy but I'm not necessarily enthralled when it rains 
something about the rain. It just kind of makes me feel cold and shivery for the rest of the day, but helps me sleep really well. You ever notice when it rains, you can sleep like a baby? It's crazy too. I'll sleep an extra hour or two like it's nothing. And it's a good sleep. You wake up feeling energized, you know? At least for me. I'm sure there's other people that can't stand when it's raining, but as far as sleep goes, I like, I like to sleep when it's raining, definitely. So, I guess the $64,000 question I have for you, boys and girls, is are you starting to drink the water? I gave you a homework assignment, drinking a bottle of water at 10, drinking a bottle of water at one, drinking a bottle of water at six, and I can guarantee you that 90% of you probably didn't do that. Yet, I'd be willing to bet half of you did drink water today, just not necessarily on a schedule. So that's not a big deal for you, but for the other half that didn't drink water, you gotta sometimes force yourself to drink the water, okay? Get yourself a 36 pack of bottled water the next time you're at the grocery store and start to obey my commands. So start to drink some water in the morning at 10 o'clock. Just guzzle a bottle, it ain't gonna kill you. Then repeat the process at noon or one and then repeat the process again at five or six. We gotta get this water in you. If you start doing this consistently, you'll start noticing that when you take a piss, your piss is a lot clearer. I always like that too. When you get one of those really dark yellow pisses, you kind of feel dirty, you know? <laughs> start peeing clear, you feel like, oh my goodness, my system's cleared, my goodness, here I go. So let's say the aliens aren't aliens. Let's say they are just time traveling humans from the future. If that's what we look like in the future, oh my goodness, we got to stop that now. The reason I think that the aliens, if they are real, which I'm not sure they are, but if they are, the reason I think they might actually be humans from the future is what we were talking about the other day they might want to come down and have, not sex, but they might want to get genes from us at this point in our life before we started making bad decisions. Hey, how's it going? Now that person just there that was walking, just based on their look, they look like they're, you know, maybe in their 60s or 70s. But the 60 and 70 year old is walking more than the people that are younger than them? That's crazy. There's a student walking in front of me about as slow as you could imagine. So if you've been walking with me since day one, you're on about your fourth day or so now. You're not addicted to walking yet, but you're probably noticing that it's a little bit easier today than it was a couple days ago, which is always good. I, uh, I keep thinking about that Chronically Stephanie channel that we're watching. I can't get over how challenging it is for some people that are young and I consider a person in their mid-30s to be young I just can't believe how challenging it is for people to uh, you know be able to stay healthy and stuff normally I would go that way but I don't feel like trying to outwalk the students and I don't feel like talking with the student walking next to me the whole time. But my goodness, some people make walking so slow that it's like, you know, you're never gonna be in shape that way. Sometimes people will be like, hey, I'm going to Walmart today and I'm, I'm, that's where I'm gonna do my walking. That does not count. That's what I can't stand about steps. 
you put on a little pedometer on your waist and you, or, or on your phone or your watch and all of a sudden you think you're accomplishing something because you took a thousand steps at work, that is like the worst exercise ever. There are some people that'll laugh at me and say, and walking is pretty weak. And I'll agree with them, walking's pretty weak. But if it is weak, you gotta at least make the most out of it and actually walk. I just don't consider it walking when you uh, take 15 steps, stop to chat, stop to you know, put something in your mouth and then uh, go sit down again for another half hour before you repeat that process. I just think that's the most worthless exercise ever. And I think it's being sold to people that they're doing something special. So just between you and me, if you ever meet a person that you want to walk with and they say, oh, I'm not really into walking, but just so you know, I take a thousand steps a day or whatever, just know what old Jesse here thinks they're full of it. And uh, those are the same people that when they actually do start gaining weight, which will eventually happen to most of us, those are the same people that'll ask you what you're doing, thinking that you're cheating the system. And the truth is you're just having some me time by walking your neighborhood. By the way, if you are in your fourth day, I'm hoping that you're taking slightly different routes each day. And if you are taking slightly different routes each day throughout your neighborhood, I'm hoping you're seeing some houses that look nice. You might even see some ways that the people manicure their lawns and you might say to yourself, I like the way that looks. I'm going to do that to my house. It's funny how neighborhoods, and this one's no different, for as average as the neighborhood looks now, 20 years ago it wasn't so average. It was kind of above average. It was actually average then too, but it looked much nicer than it does now. If your neighborhood's kind of been dragged down through the last couple of years or decades, maybe you could share that with us in the comments. There's a, there's a couple of ways that we can improve our neighborhoods. We can start walking through them more. The more we walk, the more eyes are on the neighborhood, the more challenging it is for people to do crime. A lot of times people will break into the house because they think the neighbors don't care because they think no one's watching because they think there is no camera. Now the reality is there's cameras everywhere but they don't catch everything. But if you can be out daily with your eyes open, it discourages people from wanting to jump into other people's backyards. So by walking, I think you make the neighborhood safer to a certain degree. Now don't get me wrong, you're not the police, so if you see something crazy, pull out your cell phone and make a phone call. Don't try to be a hero. Because golly, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be crappy to get killed because you're trying to save someone's backyard? <laughs> you know? Remember, if bad people want to do something, whether it's breaking into a house or stabbing somebody, anything that bad people want to do, ultimately they're gonna do it you know we can discourage them we can try to make it challenging we can try to make it where they don't want to do those things but at the end of the day people have free will for a reason and if they're gonna do bad there's nothing you can really do to stop it what you can do though to remedy it is not become that type of person right we all have choices when you go into your buddy's house and you see that he's got money on top of his dresser, this used to happen to me when I was in my 20s. I had a buddy that had a lot of money on his dressers and occasionally I would pull a dollar from him or a quarter or two and I always saw it as no big deal, but looking back, that's pretty low. That's pretty horrible actually. We shouldn't do that, especially not to our friends. I always kind of validate it by saying, oh, I just took a couple quarters, no big deal. And it was quarters that I would use, right? I would go to the pool area and, and put it in the soda machine, pull out a Coke. Just another reason to quit drinking so many sodas. So you're not thinking about stealing quarters from people, you know? As you get older, you start to acquire things, you start to pay your bills off, and then you go home and you realize, hey, that poker night, somebody stole my this, that, and the other, my trinket whatever the case might be, that, that pisses people off. 
I can't stand thieves. But if I was gonna be 100% honest, you know, when I was younger, I would probably, like I said, grab money off my friend's uh, dresser like it was no big deal. That's not being a good friend. And if there's an accounting for everything, then maybe that's why I've been, had stuff stolen from me, you know? Sometimes when you're the bad guy, sometimes it's good to get what's coming to you. I believe there's a saying now that I love because uh, you hear it all the time. It's F around and find out. If you're a bad guy, you're going to keep effing around and you're going to find out one of these days. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. If there's never anything to learn from it, if you never take an L, you never lose, you always get away with things, that's how the world gets evil. Justice. Every now and then you need justice. You need some justice to be served. That's why it's so irritating when you see the pictures of all these smash and grabs, right? Where you get like a hundred teenagers and they break windows and start stealing everything. And sometimes they're not teenagers. Sometimes they're very much adults. It's frustrating because what happens when they do smash and grabs? They end up closing down those businesses. And so the people that are working there lose their jobs. Now they have to consolidate and find jobs elsewhere in the businesses that haven't shut down. So it makes it that much more challenging for other people to find jobs. All because people want to be lazy. All because people want to blame it on society and oh, these people have to steal because you know that's the hand that has been dealt to them. I never believe that. There's never a reason for you as a human being to blatantly choose the wrong thing to do. Make a change in this world. Make a change in this world by doing the right thing. And that's why a change in this world ultimately happens with the man in the mirror. It happens with you. And this is another good thing with walking. Walking can really help you collect your thoughts so that you can really make good decisions. If I would have collected my thoughts and thought about what I was doing to my friend by taking a couple of dollars or a couple of quarters off of his dresser, maybe I would have stopped myself. Maybe, you know. I just think that a lot of times we make selfish decisions. Why are we as a people so selfish? And if you're one of those people that isn't selfish, you're selfless, God bless you, keep up the good work. 95% of the time, I am selfless, and I don't have this giant ego. But I'll tell you what, every now and then, I am selfish. And I think if we all could take time to be honest with, if nobody else, be honest with ourselves, I think we'd realize that a lot of the problems that we're experiencing aren't because the world's this horrible place, it's because we tend to make bad decisions. And every time we make bad decisions, they have a, the ability and they tend to multiply and get worse. They compound daily, like we want the interest in a bank to do, but it doesn't, because how the heck can you make anything on a savings account that provides 0% interest? By the way, how do they even call it a savings account if it has 0% interest? It seems awful. Speaking of awful, this house right here, every day I walk by it, it says, hi, you're being recorded. Like, who wants to hear that every day? But the reason they have that is because there's people out there that are suspect. They're hoping to deter them. They know that that voice isn't going to stop anything, but it does end up working to stop thieves because they're like, hey, that's the house where we know there's a camera. Let's go to the next house. Same with the club. I still have a club from like 30 years ago. My club in my car, which fits on my steering wheel, it's proven they can cut your steering wheel and take it right off, right? But I feel like that club just screams, you don't want this bad boy. Move on, you don't want this smoke, you know? So if you're ever in a spot where you have an old car, even though you think it's too old for somebody to want to steal, 
you'd be surprised people will steal just about anything so if you have an old car I would really recommend getting a club even if it's at a yard sale or a Goodwill and it's only a dollar fifty buy it buy it put it on it basically just screams to the potential car thief, you know, car thief, uh, you know, go to the next car. Which is kind of crappy because you're basically telling people, not my car, go for another victim, right? But, you know, I can't really afford to have them steal my car. Can you? My car is paid for, so if they steal it, I don't have full insurance to replace nothing. As a matter of fact, my car is so old that uh, I can't really get it insured. Nobody will fully insure it. I have to have liability at this point, which is kind of weird. I didn't even know that was a thing until I called insurances and they're like, your car is too old. Its value is too low. You can't get full insurance on that.